OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Both of these are crucial to our success. And now I will turn things over to Tara Cataldo. Uh, Tara is Science Collections Coordinator at the University of Florida. And Tara will kick things off for us. Hi, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are all here for Cues and Clues, How Students Identify Online Resources in the Face of Container Collapse. And let's start off with some introductions first. My name is Tara Cataldo. I am the Science Collections Coordinator at the University of Florida, which is in Gainesville, Florida. And my partner today. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Sear, and I'm an Associate Research Scientist at OCLC Research in beautiful, snowy Dublin, Ohio. And also joining us, Chris and I are your main presenters today, but joining us for the Q&A, we have a couple other colleagues. Let's let them say hello. Hi, I'm Brittany Brannon. I'm a research support specialist at OCLC, uh, hanging out in the snow with Chris. Hi, and I'm Amy Bueller. I'm an engineering librarian at the University of Florida, um, hanging out here in sunny Florida, although it is very cold this morning. <laughs> Not cold enough for the OCLC people, though. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, Brittany and Amy. They are also going to be monitoring the uh, chat box for your questions and getting us all organized for the Q&A a little later. So thank you, guys. But we are just four members of a large multi-institutional research team with those of us from not only University of Florida and OCLC Research, but also Rutgers University. And our project is called Researching Students' Information Choices. And we have been studying these students, 175 students that range from fourth grade all the way up to graduate school. And we have divided this 175 students into six educational cohorts. And we'll kind of, as we tell you things about them, we'll mention these cohorts. So briefly to describe them, starting with the youngest ones there, we have a cohort of fourth and fifth graders, which here in the United States, we refer to as elementary school. Then we have grades six through eight, which we call middle schoolers. And in grades nine through 12, we call high school. Then we have a group of community college students, a group of university undergraduate students, and a group of university graduate students. And we have been studying these students' online search behavior around the issue of container collapse. Now, what is container collapse? I know you have that question. And it has to do with this. Once upon a time, these were the containers that we got most of our information through, and they could be very distinctive. There wasn't a lot of confusion between uh, when you were holding a newspaper versus holding a book. You had a newspaper in your hand, you knew that a journalist wrote uh, the articles in there, probably went through some editing, and from the time of the incident that they're writing about to it getting to you was probably a quick uh, turnaround. Um, because you were holding a newspaper. Same time you were holding a book in your hand, you knew, oh, this was written by an author or a set of authors. It went through a lot of editing, took a long time to get to you. Uh, it was gonna be a lot more in depth and thorough. Um, and you knew all that by the physicality of holding a book. But instead of looking at these containers, this is where the majority of us are getting our information now. So. No more physical containers to give us clues. We're all looking at different screens of one type or another. And in this online environment, items like a journal article like this one look pretty similar to a book chapter like this one. And so that is what we are describing as container collapse. We coined the term to describe how uh, we're in the physical format. There was context and clues to give you uh, an idea of the container. In the digital format, these items are decanted from their original container. And now we have to make some more uh, evaluative efforts in trying to determine what journey that information took to get to us. Now, this is not a, a new phenomenon. We've recently coined the term container collapse, but this behavior and the 
uh, confusion that it's been causing has been noted by the library and information science community for quite a while now. Researchers and practitioners have been noting it. It's peppered throughout the literature. And in addition to kind of making note of it and saying, hey, somebody should research this, uh, we were also making some assumptions about the students of today in terms of it. So this is a quote from a JISC study in 2007 where they said the Google generation are format agnostic and have little interest in these containers. And you see that kind of uh, assumption peppered throughout the literature as well as they, uh, people note this behavior. But we had 175 students in front of us, so we said, we're not going to assume. Let's ask them what they, they think of the container. And so we specifically asked them the question, do you think it is important to know the online information is in a container like a book, a journal, a blog, a newspaper, et cetera? And our students overwhelmingly said, yes, it was important to them. Um, overall, the whole group, 86% said yes. And you can see here in this chart that we break it up into our cohorts and, and see where some differences lie. Um, our graduate students, 100%, every single one of them said this was important. 97% of the rest of the higher education students did. And then as we start getting into the kids, we start seeing more no's up, uh, up in there. And so that's going to be very interesting. Does that change as they go up through their educational levels and are exposed to more uh, different formats of resources? Or are they the new Google generation? And they're going to be bringing these new attitudes with them as they come up through it, uh, the academic world. So here were the, some of the, the uh, quotes around the students answering this question, some of the observations they made. Um, got a couple undergraduate students here who said, yes, it's important to know the container, that it help you decide how credible it is. Another undergraduate said, for the sake of citing, you have to know where you're citing from. And even a high school student who said, I feel like you have to know the perspective it was being written from, and felt that the container helped them do that. But I don't want to discount our, our younger, wonderful participants who said no. Uh, what were they saying around that? They're saying, I need no, as long as it's good, useful information, why not use it? Or I don't really care where it's coming from or what it's coming from. I just care if it's good or not. They like that term, good information. So it's this container collapse has been observed for quite a while. Um, it's, we know that it's causing confusion. We determined the, that today's students actually do care about it and care about knowing the container. Uh, but what do we get at the heart of the issue? Why is there confusion? Uh, what students help students identify containers correctly? What is hindering them uh, from doing so? Um, and that's what we set out to study. This is how we did it. We were funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services for a four-year research project. There were 12 researchers on the project and an eight-member advisory panel, uh, with other librarians and teachers on that panel to help us out. And again, we studied 175 students using four Google simulations. More about those Google simulations are coming up. Now, you can't study the container issue in a vacuum, right? It's a piece of the overall evaluation of information. And we all know that that is very important in having critical thinking skills around the information you're finding. Well, a scope of our study was to look at students' early research inquiry for a school project. And we, in that, we wanted to study their point of selection behavior. So they're studying, um, uh, starting off with, with a project they have, they have to do. They're going to their first round of searching um, and what they do in that behavior. And what do they do to makes them select an information resource and say, hey, this is meeting a need that I have. Uh, because we are doing the very beginning inquiry process, that's why we're doing Google simulations. So kind of defy anyone in the audience to tell us that the students aren't using Google for schoolwork. Um, and I'll tell you that all 175 came in. Nobody said, I've never searched Google before. It was a very comfortable environment for them. So. And looking at this overall behavior, we took the students through several levels of judgment of what they were finding on Google. Was it helpful for their school assignment? Was it citable? Would you actually put it in your list of references? Um, what, what was the credibility of the source that you were finding? And finally, again, could they identify the container of what they were finding? 
So we created these simulations, and I am going to show you what one of those looks like. So give me a moment here to pull up my video. And everyone can see that there. All right. So our students came to us face-to-face uh, -face meetings. They sat with a researcher, um, the, the student in a room with a laptop. And we placed that laptop in front of them, and this is what they saw. They were first introduced to their topic for school, which was on the Burmese Python uh, problems in the Florida Everglades. And then they were presented with a Google search screen where they typed in their search for uh, their topic. Then they got Google search results, and we're taking through a helpful task. Which of these resources is helpful for your school assignment on the Burmese Python? And they could completely interact with everything that they saw there. Open it up, play a video, bring a PDF up. After they picked the helpful resources, they were asked if it was citable. Would you cite that resource uh, in your, your bibliography? And there's a simple yes and no there. Then we asked them about the resources they didn't find helpful. What was wrong with these? Why didn't you like them? We got a lot of good information out of that. Then we gave them their helpful resources again and said, hey, let's rate the credibility of this on a scale of one to five. And then finally, we asked them to identify the container of a, a preset uh, a bunch of resources that were in their Google search results. That was the end. So that's the video in one moment. I'm going to get back to my screen. That was the simulation in one minute. These research sessions actually took anywhere from 30 minutes to two and a half hours, depending on the student and going through all those different tasks. But everything you saw there was created by our research team. We used a software called Articulate Storyline, and we controlled everything. We picked all the resources that, uh, that had, we decided how, uh, interactive they would be, the order that they would appear in the Google search results. And no matter what the student typed in their Google search screen, the students in the same cohort had the same set of search results. And so that helped us compare apples to apples. So we created our own little Google lab environment. Now, I went, no, I went through uh, this last part real quickly, so I just wanted to emphasize. So we are giving you uh, results from that last task, that one where they were identifying the, con the container. Again, they had eight containers uh, to choose from. You can see those listed here. Uh, and so we're gonna be showing those results. And this simulation was great in many ways. It gave us that ability to um, do that, create that lab environment but this Articulate Storyline software also captured data on the back end. So every time you saw a click there, every time they opened up a resource, that captured a data point on the back end. So we got this big, giant, quantitative data file from their simulation sessions. But also while they were in there with us, we utilized the Think Aloud protocol. Um, and so as the students were taking the simulation, we had them talking the whole time. Tell us what you're thinking. What are you looking at? Why did you pick that? Um, and got a big, rich data set from that that was all recorded, it was transcribed, and then our wonderful colleagues over at OCLC Research created the most beautiful code books, and then we all coded the 175 transcripts and put that all into a software called Envivo, and that gave us our massive qualitative data file, so we can pull a lot of rich data from that. In addition, as if that wasn't enough, we also have surveys and interviews with the students. So it's really quite the mixed method study um, and gave us tons of data. And now Chris is going to be pulling and telling you information from different pieces of this, from our, our quantitative data, the qualitative and surveys and interviews. He tells you how well the students did identifying container. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Tara. So for this part of the project, we were interested in seeing how well students identified containers and why some students were able to identify more containers correctly than other students were able to. So let's take a look at the numbers. Uh, in this chart, I have the 
different uh, percent ranges uh, that students got correct in terms of identifying containers, uh, the number of students who fell into each percent range. Uh, so you can see, for example, that 46 students fell into between 50 and 60 percent. That means that they correctly identified 50 to 60 percent of the containers that they tried to identify. Uh, most students fell somewhere between that 40 to 70 percent range, which I think is telling because it tells us that overall students do still have some idea that containers are a thing, even in the case in the uh, event of container collapse. But it also shows that container collapse is a real phenomenon. So we had no students get 100% of the containers correct. And we had a few students who got almost none of the containers correct. Our specific research question was, why did some students identify more containers correctly than others? And we were interested in looking at the statistical predictors. So things about a student you could use to try to make a prediction of what percentage of containers they would correctly identify. And in particular, we were interested in three different categories for statistical predictors. I'll talk about them in more detail on the next slide, but we were looking at their demographic characteristics, the cues that they mentioned during their think aloud protocols, and then the behaviors that they had during the simulation that were captured by the simulation software. And we weren't just interested in seeing which of these things help and which hurt. We were also interested in seeing the magnitude of the impact. So, you know, it could be the case, for example, that paying attention to both the source and the author helps you identify containers, but paying attention to the source helps you more than the author. So we wanted to be able to uh, identify cases like that. Here we have the specific sets of variables that we looked at. As I mentioned on the last slide, we were interested in their demographics. These would be things about the student that came uh, from before they came into the simulation that we were able to get from them in their interviews prior to the simulation. So we decided to look at their educational cohort. As Tara mentioned earlier, they were in one of six education levels, ranging anywhere from elementary school up to graduate school. We also asked them to rate their level of confidence searching for information online on a scale from one to five, and we looked at the impact that that has. And then we also wanted to know about either first-generation college students or people who could potentially be first-generation college students if they're not in college yet. So we asked them whether their parent or guardian has a bachelor's degree. Then we were also interested in cues. So cues were things that they mentioned during the Think Aloud protocol, uh, and they were a sign of what they were attending to when they were trying to identify containers. One of the cues we were interested in is genre. So within each container, there could be several different genres, uh, whether something has a video, whether it has an article, whether it has a table or a graph or a picture, anything like that. We recorded every time they mentioned that as a cue that they used to identify the container. We also recorded every time they mentioned the source of something. For example, one of the resources that they looked at had um, an advertisement for a boat ride that people could take in the Florida Everglades. And sometimes participants mentioned that as a way that they judged the container. We coded every time they men uh, mentioned the uh, visual appearance of the uh, container, which would be uh, if they said something looks good, if they said something looks ugly, if they mentioned it's all capitals or anything like that. Uh, we coded every time they mentioned the URL. So if they said, uh, you know, something is a .com, it's a .gov. And we coded every time they said something about the Google results snippet that appears on the search results page. Finally, we looked at the behaviors that were captured by the Storyline software. Uh, so we captured the total amount of time that they spent on the simulation. We looked at the number of different container labels that they applied during the container task. Um, remember, there were eight different container labels that they could use. And so we looked at, did they use all of them or did they use only a few of them? And finally, we captured the number of different resources that they clicked on and explored while they were trying to identify the containers during the container task. To see the impact that each of these had on the percent of containers that they successfully identified, we used a technique called multivariate regression. And this is a statistical technique that allows us to determine a few things. First of all, it will tell us the chance that the relationship that we see is due to one of these things having an impact on the percentage that they got correct, um, as opposed to random statistical noise. Typically, we consider a relationship to be statistically significant if they 
is if there is at least a 90% chance that there's a relationship there. Uh, otherwise, we presume that the relationship is not statistically significant. This will also tell us if it is a positive or a negative relationship. So if it's a positive relationship, it would mean that that variable increases the percentage of containers that we expect them to get correct. Uh, for example, if we see a positive relationship between mentioning genre and uh, container identification, it would mean that those students who attended to the genre on average got a higher percentage correct than the students who did not attend to the genre. A negative relationship, conversely, would be one that decreases the percentage. So it could be the case, for example, that students who attended to the URL on average did not do quite as well as students who did not attend to the URL in terms of container identification. Uh, and this type of technique would tell us that. Another thing that's important to understand is it gives us controlled comparisons. So when you run one of these statistical models, you can put a few different variables in and it will show you the independent impact of each of those variables when the others are held constant. So if you ran one, for example, that included their educational cohort and then also included aboutness, so did they say something about the conceptual focus of the resource? Uh, the impact that we would see for aboutness would be when educational cohort is held constant or among students within the same educational cohort. Uh, this is a useful technique, but one concern that it introduces is that sometimes the relationships that you see are particularly sensitive to the specific set of control variables that you include in the model. So it's usually good practice when you're doing this to run a few different statistical models that have different sets of control variables in. That way you can see which of your findings hold strong no matter which variables you include uh, and which of them fall apart when you put in the control variables. So for this study, we ran four different statistical models, one that includes just the demographic variables, one that includes just the cues, one that includes just the behaviors that were captured by storyline, and then one that includes every single variable that we looked at in this uh, specific part of the study. Now I wanna go into a little bit about why we do these controlled comparisons, because it seems like there might be a simpler way to do this. You know, for example, if we were interested in seeing the impact that aboutness has on correct container identification, we could just look at the people who didn't pay attention to aboutness on average, what percent did they get correct? And then the people who did pay attention to aboutness on average, what percent did they get correct and compare those two numbers? Uh, I did something similar over on the right hand side of this. You can see that chart lists all of the different educational cohorts and then on average, what percent did they get correct? So we can see, for example, that elementary schoolers on average got 37% correct whereas graduate schoolers on average got 63% correct. And just visualizing that relationship, you can tell it's positive. People in higher cohorts on average get a higher percent of resources correct. The problem though with just doing this for some of the relationships we're interested in is that there's a risk of finding what's called a spurious correlation, or this is where two of the variables you're interested in might appear to be correlated with each other, but it's because there's actually a third variable that's uh, really driving the bus with those relationships. The classic example of this would be that in New York City, there's a strong correlation between crime rates and ice cream sales. Uh, now, this is not because buying ice cream is causing people to go on crime sprees, but rather there's a third variable that impacts both of them, and that is temperature. When it's warmer outside, typically people buy more ice cream. Also, when it's warmer outside, typically crime rates go up. And when you account for temperature or control for temperature in your model, you see the correlation between crime rate and ice cream sales disappears. So why is this relevant for this study? Well, remember that we have students ranging all the way from elementary school to graduate school. And as we can see, typically students who are at higher educational cohorts also are a little bit better at identifying containers. A lot of the cues that we're interested in, we also have strong reason to believe track with cohort. Uh, for example, elementary schoolers typically uh, have fewer tools in their toolbox for evaluating resources. So they're a little bit more reliant on the aboutness or the conceptual focus of a resource than students in higher cohorts are. And so if we find that negative relationship between attending to aboutness and the percent of containers that they correctly identified, you know, is that because they're actually related to each other or is that just a case where cohort is driving the bus? So if we count or control for cohort in that model, then we can tell independently what the impact of attending to aboutness is. 
All right, with that explanation out of the way, let's take a look at some of the results. So first I'm going to show you the results for the demographic variables that we looked at. Here we just have some descriptive statistics. Um, as Tara mentioned earlier, the cohorts that we had ranged anywhere from 26 to 30 students. 67% of the people in the study had a parent or a guardian with a bachelor's degree, meaning that about 33% of them were either first generation college students or had the potential to be first generation college students. And over on the right of this slide, you can see a chart I made of the number of students who fell into each level of confidence for searching for information online. So you can see that the most common was a four out of five. 84 students said that they rated themselves a four out of five in searching for information online. And almost everyone was at a, at least a three or above. There were only five students who rated themselves below that. So this would be showing that overall students do feel relatively confident, if not perfectly confident, finding information on the internet. Here I have a chart summarizing the findings for these variables. I do have the uh, chart with the full numbers if anyone is interested in seeing it, but I think sometimes when you're just trying to understand these relationships, it can be a little bit easier to just see is it a positive, negative, or insignificant relationship. Over on the left side of this chart, you'll see these three demographic variables, and we ran them in two statistical models, one that includes just the demographic variables, and that would be in the middle column, and then one that includes all of the variables, and that's over on the right column. So it includes also the cues and the behaviors. Uh, if there's a positive sign, that would be that there is a statistically significant positive relationship. Uh, if you see a minus sign and there are none on this chart, that would mean that there is a statistically significant negative relationship. And if you see nothing, then that would mean that there is no statistically significant relationship. As you can see from this chart, all three of the demographic variables that we looked at had a statistically significant positive relationship. And these uh, findings held strong regardless of whether we controlled for just demographic variables or whether we controlled for all of the variables. So with cohort, this means that students in higher cohorts do tend to identify more containers correctly. With confidence, this would mean that students who are confident searching for information do seem to accurately rate their confidence, so they do a little bit better identifying containers. And finally, if you have a parent or a guardian with a bachelor's degree, on average, even after controlling for cohort confidence, uh, you are in general expected to identify more containers correctly. The other cool thing about regression analysis, though, is that it doesn't just allow us to see if a relationship is statistically significant or statistically insignificant but we can also tell something about the magnitude or the size of the relationship. On this chart, I have five hypothetical students, and they are the same in terms of their educational cohort. They're in same, the same in terms of their uh, first-generation college student status. The only difference between them is their level of confidence searching for information online. The person who rates himself as a one is expected to get 51% of containers correct, but if you follow all the way over to the person who rates themselves as a five, they're expected to get 14% more containers correct, or they're expected to get 65% of containers correct. So this is showing that that relationship with confidence is not just statistically significant, but it's also pretty substantively meaningful. Uh, if you feel confident about yourself searching for information online, you feel confident about these skills, you do uh, tend to do better finding or uh, identifying resource containers. Now let's take a look at the impact of being a first generation college student. So here we have two hypothetical college students, Logan and Danielle. They're both undergraduates, so they're both in the same educational cohort. They both uh, rate themselves as a four out of five in terms of identifying information online. The only difference between them in terms of the variables we looked at is that Logan is a first generation college student, Danielle is not. And just, just with that, Logan's expected to get 55% correct. Danielle's expected to identify 61% of containers correctly. So she gets 6% more correct just for not being a first generation college student. And I think this is pretty meaningful for libraries because it shows that there are opportunities to reach out to first generation college students and help develop some of the information literacy skills because you know, it's one of those things where some of the other things we look at, like cues, uh, behaviors, there are things students can do about it to change which cues they focus on. 
a first generation college student is something where students can't change it. You know, they either are or they aren't, and it's based on things that their parents did rather than um, kind of their own personal uh, behaviors when they're finding information. Now let's take a look at the cues. As a reminder, the cues were the things that they mentioned during the Think Aloud protocol when they were doing the container task. Here we have a chart showing which cues students mentioned most commonly. So you can see that the genre, so whether something uh, they've referred to it as a video, an article, a table, a chart, anything like that, was the most common. 146 out of the 175 students paid attention to the genre. The second most common was source. So if they said something was from New York Times, if they said something was from NPR, if they said something was from Wiley, uh, anything like that, 119 of the 175 students did that. A little bit less common were the aboutness and the URL, but still most students mentioned those. So aboutness as a reminder is saying something about the conceptual focus of the resource. URL is mentioned anything about the URL that they see. And then the other ones that we looked at were not quite as common. Most students did not mention that, but there was still a decent number that did. These would be the visual appearance and the Google snippet. Here we have the results for this. I'm going to talk through it in more detail on the next slide, but I wanted you to be able to uh, just quickly see which ones were significant and insignificant. Once again, on the left-hand side of this, we have the different variables. Uh, if you're interested in seeing their impact, if you follow it over to the middle one, you'll see just the model that includes cues. And then if you follow it over to the right-hand side, you'll see the full model that includes all variables. Uh, one where this is particularly important, you can see the impact of controls, is that in just the cues model, we do see a negative result for Google Snippet. But then once we control for the other variables, that relationship goes away. So it appears to not be as strong as, say, the relationship for genre, which is there even when we include the other controls. So let's look at the magnitude of the impact for each of these variables. I've grouped them into which ones help, which ones hurt, and then which ones have no significant impact. And you can see that genre and source both do help students identify containers. The students who attended to them tended to do better identifying containers than the students who did not attend to them. Genre was the one that helped the most of the ones that we looked at. Depending on the model you look at, it was anywhere between a 6 and a 16% increase in the percentage of containers that they correctly identified. If you attend to the source, that also increased the percent by about 5% uh, in one of our statistical models. And I think it's interesting that these are the two that help because if you think about it, these are the ones that require a little bit deeper engagement with the resource. So saying something about the genre or the source requires you to not just look at the resource, but also think about it in some way. Think about who made it. Think about how they're presenting the information. And you can contrast this with some of the other cues that we looked at, which are more heuristics. So just judging the visual appearance or the URL of something are a little bit easier. They don't require as much deep engagement, but the evidence here shows that they also don't help students identify containers. Those who attended to them didn't do any better or any worse than those who did not attend to them. And finally, we had some cues that actually hurt. Uh, the Google snippet in one of our models caused a 13% decrease in the percentage of containers that they were expected to correctly identify. And then the aboutness or the conceptual focus of the resource uh, something that might be useful in terms of deciding which resources are going to be helpful for writing a paper, but in terms of identifying containers, if you focus on what they are writing about, that actually decreases your ability to identify the container by about 5%. Finally, we can take a look at the behaviors that were captured with the simulation software. Here we have the number of different container labels that they used. If you remember, they had those eight container labels that they would drag in order to label each of the containers that they were asked about. Only 28 students used all eight of the container labels. Most of them used only six or seven. I think this is once again showing that students do have a conception of container, but they don't have a perfect conception of it. They don't know all of the different container types. In particular, students had a lot of trouble with preprints. A lot of them asked the interviewer what a preprint was. 
here we have the number of resources that they clicked on during the simulation. And you can see I broke it down into ranges of uh, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and then 20 or more. And most students were somewhere in that 10 to 20 range. So they did click on and explore some of the resources during the container task, but not all of them. And here we can see the results for the behavior variables we looked at. The total simulate simulation duration or the amount of time that they spent on the simulation did have, have a negative impact in both of our models. It was statistically significant, uh, but I can tell you that the magnitude of the impact was relatively small um, to the point where I don't think it was particularly meaningful substantively. I think the other ones were a lot more telling. So the number of container labels that they clicked on in our model that just looked at the behavior variables did have a positive impact. So when you click on more container labels, you were more likely to uh, identify more containers correctly. But once we included the other control variables, that relationship went away. I think in particular, when you control for cohort, that makes um, the relationship statistically insignificant. The one that remains statistically significant, regardless of which variables you include in the model is the resources clicked. If you click into more resources, you are expected to identify more resources correctly. And we can see this relationship with two more hypothetical people, Brennan and Mia. During the simulation, Brennan clicked into every single resource and explored it when identifying its container. Mia didn't click onto any of them. She used the Google search results page in order to identify the containers. And just based on that one difference alone, even when you control for all of the other variables that we looked at in our models, Brennan is expected to get 69% of res uh, containers correctly identified. Mia is only expected to get 50%, so a 19% increase because Brennan clicked in and explored the resources. And with that, now that I've talked about the findings, I'm going to turn it back over to Tara, who's going to talk a little bit more about the substantive meaning of these findings. Thank you, Chris. Okay, let's go on to your next slide. So let's kind of weave together everything about Chris was talking about. So in terms of being able to identify containers of online information, um, what's the Big takeaways is it does require deep engagement with the resources. You can see that uh, students that did better on this were ones who clicked into the resource and didn't rely on just Google's information uh, on the results screen to help them out. That wasn't helping them. So clicking in and exploring the resource on their own. And while we all know the, the reasons that we employ shortcuts and heuristics, um, there's a lot of information out there. We need things to help them out. There are heuristics that are just not helping the students with this, as we can see from the data, like the URL, the visual um, appearance, and the Google snippet. Things that are helping them out are focusing on certain cues uh, of, that will lead them to the container type, and that includes the genre and the source of uh, the resource. And uh, having a significant impact, but not something that they, the students themselves, can control, but their life experience mattered. Um, the educational level, the differences between the different uh, cohorts and that uh, the higher your education level, the better you did at uh, con uh, container identification accuracy. Then students with um, parents and or guardians with a college degree were better able to identify containers and those with a higher level of confidence in searching online information, they too were better at uh, the searching and um, identifying the containers. Now, but what does that mean for our, our practice going forward, the, the findings that we have, the data that we have? Um, we're talking about students, so of course we're thinking information literacy and how to, how to make them more successful students. And so here's a few things that we're kind of focusing on that jumped out at us as we analyze this. And there's a big movement already out there uh, that first generation college students need some more support when they get to college. It's certainly a big thing that's, that's just recently opened up at my university. And our data absolutely supports this, this cause, that they do need some more focus and some more help when they come in. Uh, preaching to the choir, I'm sure, when we say that they should have more information literacy before they reach college, that we need more robust uh, 
information literacy in the K through 12 environment, uh, that they need some more uh, tools under their belt before they get here. And, and uh, that supports those arguments. And then again, we know that they're going to use certain heuristics, but we may want to steer them away from the ones that aren't helping or even hurting them in their resource evaluation and steering them more towards cues that is then going to lead them into deeper engagement. And go on ahead, Chris. I myself uh, do a lot of instruction at my university, and so I thought I'd just give a couple of examples where what is learned from this research has changed in my own practice in the classroom. So a couple things. Um, when I teach a lot of citation management software, EndNotes, RefWorks, Mandalay, Zotero. I think, sometimes I think I do them all, but they don't. There's too many more out there. Um, but this is a great avenue for teaching about the container because the softwares try to identify the container for you and they have mixed success in doing so. So it doesn't take me anything but a minute to, uh, in the classroom, demonstrating or ingesting some resources to quickly find a resource that the software got wrong. But that's a great teaching moment. Like, hey, look at this. This is a journal article. And the dead, and, uh, EndNote says it's a, a website. And look, they did the fields wrong because they said it was a website. So let's go back out to the resource and look at it. Was it really a journal article? What are we looking for there? What do we have to grab to correct the, what we have in the software? So that our citation is correct. So there's a great teaching point there when teaching the uh, citation management software. Um, so go back one more, Chris. I will mention one other uh, avenue there. Um, I most recently had just started when I had the opportunity to do a hands-on activity. You know, oh, um, if someone asked me to make a worksheet for a class I'm doing or have them do some homework. Um, and I just started incorporating the container issue here. So most recently I had a class where we were comparing searching Google to searching Web of Science. And so I had that worksheet for them where they were evaluating what they found in the different resources. And I just threw in a, a, a multiple choice question into the mix that said, what is the container of that resource you're evaluating? How to choose it. And in the Web of Science, what they found in Web of Science, they all got that right, and they should have because I told them it was a journal article database. Uh, but what the results from uh, Google were much more of a mixed bag, but it was an opportunity for me to help them out. So those who got it wrong or flat out said, I don't know what this is, uh, it was my opportunity to say, okay, it is this, and this is the, the cues and things that I use to find that out and that you can use now too. So, Great little tools to go into uh, under their, their tool belt and some opportunities to do that. So we want them to have, you know, good critical thinking skills. We want them to be successful students. And we want to see a lot less of this that uh, is demonstrated here. This is a, a quote from one of our undergraduate students who is doing the container class, and it can kind of take you through what the, what's going on in their mind when they're looking at something and trying to figure out what it is. So they said, you know, what, what is it? It looks like a journal, but oh no, then they attended to the length of it. So that was a cue to them. That might be a book. And then they kept looking. Oh, yes, they saw there was chapters. So they focused on the genre piece and helped them out. They said, okay, yeah, that's a book. But then they mentioned, this is hard. And I haven't gone into in vivo and counted how many times the students said this is hard or this shouldn't be so hard when they did the container task, but it was quite a lot. And so, you know, we want to give them the tools to make uh, these kinds of evaluations a little easier. So now it's time to hear from you. Um, you noticed uh, a container class, so you're already doing something about it. You have questions for us. Uh, I think Mary Lee is going to get us going with the Q&A portion. That's right. I am. <laughs> so uh, just looking for you guys to uh, type in your questions. Be sure that the, um, that, the uh, uh, that the option is set to all participants um, so that the host and the panelists can see the questions. Um, we have a couple of uh, we have a question that um, Mercy had posed actually to attendees, um, which is uh, the findings regarding first generation students is not surprising, but interesting to see that is of significant impact and would be curious to learn 
uh, what attendees, libraries offer special information literacy programming instruction geared for first generation students. So if any of you um, have any of that, uh, that would be great to know. Um, and then uh, Carmen observes, I'd be interesting to see this study done with primary sources, uh, so materials held uh, in archives. Uh, we've noticed that students are not always citing primary sources when those uh, sources are found via a Google search. Um, so uh, that's also something that uh, I know that we at OCLC Research are interested in. So great to see that kind of interest confirmed from externally. Um, and then uh, Bruce has a question for the panelists. Given your results so far, would you expect that seeing a bib record abstract subject headings would be more like engaging sources or more like heuristics? This is a concern as we discuss our discovery layer default views. Um, so looking at things uh, in the in the more from a, a library catalog discovery perspective. So any responses? Um, that, that is an interesting question. Both Amy and I looked at each other and were like, hmm. Um, and uh, my first iteration will be that it, it would be more of a source than a heuristic. But I, I, I think I'd have to think about that. One issue that we've run into in, in the study and that led to the study is our discovery layers also aren't always getting the container right. Um, in the same way the citation mm -hmm. management software is, um, because you know a lot of things are automated uh, now, and it's not the person looking at it or having a physical object to look at. Um, so it, right. overall, it's an issue. And if it was used as a heuristic, how accurate and that, will it be helpful to them, or it will be like some of the other heuristics that give a, a negative correlation? That made me think of about 20 questions just with that question. Yeah, I think that it seems like Bruce has that concern about that discovery layer default view, maybe not uh, essentially having enough information to be able to um, correctly identify the container. I mean, like you mentioned, if the discovery layer is maybe misidentifying the container or the resource. Um, One thing I was also thinking about with that, I love this question, by the way. Um, you know, I think, yeah, if you had it in the discovery layer um, and if you had the bib records accurate, I think that could help identify container. Um, but I think you still then would have to have the training to understand why container is important. You know, why is it a big deal to know that something came from a journal versus a magazine? Um, yeah, there's a lot to think about with that. I really like that question. Okay. Oh, sorry. I agree. I think oh. I think one other thing to think about too with that is the interaction with just the bib record doesn't actually bring them to the source. So you know, your portion of the question is like, would that be like engaging the resource or more like heuristics? one of the things that we're seeing in terms of like the resource clicks is when they actually click into a resource and they have to look at it and really evaluate it. Um, that's one of the things that helps them with this um, container identification. But some of our other data also suggests that it might help them with other types of evaluation, like credibility and that kind of piece. Um, so it would be interesting to think about that bib record, not just in the context of the container, but also within the context of the other types of evaluation that students have to conduct as they look for resources. One thing I will say, if this uh, gives a little bit of a concrete answer to it, the single most correctly identified container, we had one resource that came from Google Books, and so it said right there that it was a book and almost everyone was able to get that one correct. Um, so it at least does show that if you do have some sort of an indication of container, uh, right on the discovery layer that people at least will attend to it when they're trying to identify container. Yeah, but I do think that wraps us back all the way around to kind of the beginning of this conversation, which is what happens when those containers are incorrect. And I see Mary chiming in here that some of their containers are mislabeled. Um, so, you know, in the case of the Google book, it's 
labeled a book and we know it's a book, but what happens when students encounter things that are maybe labeled books that aren't? Um, and I think that that's kind of an interesting, an interesting question to ponder. Yeah, so uh, just to read the question out, um, and Mary has clarified that this is in the catalog, so this is a, this is a bibliographic metadata that's uh, mislabeled or miscoded, um, so that some of the containers get mislabeled uh, so they can be coded wrong in the first place, and sometimes these kind of errors are um, introduced in migrating from system to system, so definitely um, a challenge, a challenge there. Uh, so, let's see. Um, I'm not seeing other questions at the. Oh, here's uh, here's one from Carmen. Based on your research, do you think a course explaining containers, the importance of libraries and archives, is something that we need to start running for first year students at the university level? So incorporating uh, the concept of containers into uh, in instruction for, um, uh, for, for students. I, I definitely have that in, in mind. Maybe not the entire thing focused on, on containers, but it's a big chunk that can be weaved in or a piece that could be weaved into all kinds of different classes. I've had ideas of MOOCs about it. Um, but where I take it is, is kind of going to depends on how it goes again. I'm just, you know, starting to incorporate into what I'm already doing and, and morphing that. Um, but I do like the idea about it. I certainly, we haven't gotten to the level yet of, tar uh, we're, we're focusing on first gen students at my university, but right now, the, if we're so early stages, we're just doing outreach to them. And so, but I know the next phase is going to be, you know, courses for them. And so I would definitely like to bring that one in there. Um, so. On the, definitely on the my radar. Yeah, I, I would agree with Tara too. I, I do think that um, there is an importance for us to sort of come in and talk to them about the container because I think it's not something that is being pervasively um, or explicitly taught in the K-12 arena. And you know, since students are engaging, you know, in virtually with most resources, it definitely becomes much more muddied as to what that container is, and then. I guess, you know, why why should you care about the container as another important sort of take home from some sort of instruction like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the really nice, there's a really nice tie in there as well to sort of the ACRL frameworks and thinking about information creation as a process, right? And so thinking about and really having this engagement with like what kind of container are we looking at? What's the genre within that container that you're engaging with for a specific resource that helps them to start understanding that the path that these different resources took to them is not necessarily equal. Um, and also to start thinking about why some resources might be more useful in some scenarios than in others. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's something that is really an important piece of information literacy. And I, I'm with Tara, I'm not sure you could do an entire course on this, but I think it's a really important part of a course that deals with these types of issues. And uh, this is this is Mercy. And to follow up on all of this, um, thinking about, I, I think the reality is there. Uh, this points to a lot of opportunities at a lot of different points. Um, and so, yes, realizing that for first gen students, uh, there's some intervention there. But obviously, uh, just for students, uh, you know, the, the younger the cohorts. Um, the less uh, awareness they have of this. And so thinking about disseminating the need for this uh, through, like you said, K through 12, uh, maybe through um, library schools for, uh, for school librarians to think about many opportunities that they have with uh, often more direct inter interactions with the students that they serve, uh, whether there are some things in place to get uh, this awareness of containers uh, already in mind so that when they arrive at universities, uh, it's not entirely new concept. Uh, so I think mostly you're pointing to lots of, lots of opportunities and uh, lots of uh, ideas for possible intervention points. to unmute here to read the question. Um, we have a question from uh, Aiden, 
Any recommendation, any recommended LIS resources about why the container is an important aspect of context and literacy? Um, so there's a, there's a question um, for our panelists and also uh, just some really um, interesting uh, kind of aha moments, I think, uh, from um, uh, Alexandra Provo um, talking about opportunities for uh, uh, intervention in the catalog. So uh, kind of indicating more about, um, more explicitly about uh, container types um, in the catalog uh, and um, when the full resource is not available digitally, click into, to click into how can we improve, enrich, alter our metadata to better present some of the aspects that positively affect container identification. Um, so really good, uh, good, good thinking about not just Google, but how do we um, uh, uh, make things a more positive um, experience in our own discovery environments. Great interaction. Okay, so the first part of that about in the LIS, uh, I might punt to Brittany because she's already mentioned the ACRL frame. I think we've seen a lot in the, or starting to see a lot in the standards. Do you want to field that, Brittany? Or? Sure. I've, I've been sitting here sort of pondering that, and I would say I, I don't have any specifically about container. One of the things I think that we've noticed as we've been conducting this is that there's a lot of sort of chat about containers and their importance, but I have not found any great sort of ready-made 